Be seated, please. Glad to have you this morning in person or, or watching online, and uh, I, I really do want to say thank you, genuinely. It is, uh, we, we are in a place where, as, as Ray said during the announcements, I mean, the, the COVID numbers that we have experienced in the past and, and where they are rising now, uh, the state of Tennessee is is number one in the nation i saw a statistic yesterday if we were if we were a sovereign nation we would be the number two country in the world right now uh and and, and so my point in this is i really genuinely do want to thank you it's it's been amazing how everyone has gone with this uh spreading out and wearing masks and watching online and and loving each other and loving neighbors. And so just as an aside, I, I really am thankful, thankful for that. Um, last week we started uh, a series on Acts that we're gonna spend a good amount of time in. And so last week we talked about Acts chapter one. And in Acts chapter one, there's a lot kind of getting kicked off. Uh, it. it comes in immediately following the end of Luke. Acts is Luke volume 2. And so right where Luke ends, Acts just quickly picks off. It's the next show in the sequence. And so in Acts chapter 1, we have the disciples are gathered, the big crowd is gathered, it's about 120 people, men, women, children, everyone together. And Jesus leaves. And when he leaves, he gives them the instruction of, listen, what I need from you is I, I need you to wait. And given the disciples' history, I would imagine that their thought process of waiting was, okay, later today. And instead they waited 10 days. It was 10 days until whatever Jesus said was going to happen, happened. And in that 10 days... They lived very much in the normal, right-side-up, worldly kingdom of the time. They, they worked with the rules that they knew, with the traditions that they knew. They worried about things that they had always worried about. They tried to structure things in that way. It was all business as usual. Acts chapter 2 is when everything gets flipped. Now, for the last three years or more, that's kind of been a recurring theme in our messages about one of the things, the big thing that Jesus came to do was to take the world and turn it upside down. Everything that we put value in, everything that we had placed faith in, the power structures, those in charge, everything it looked like, everything we valued and just completely flip it upside down. Acts chapter 1, it's still right side up. Acts chapter 2 is when this flip occurs. So we start in Acts chapter 2. It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived. Now, Pentecost was the 50th day uh, after Passover. So it's just 50th day after Passover. This was a, a largely a feast of agriculture. This was first fruits. Um, and it was 10 days after Jesus had left and said, hey, just wait. The important part for what we're talking about today is that Jewish tradition held that Pentecost was the day that the law was given on Mount Sinai. Pentecost, tradition held, was the day that the law was given. So on Pentecost, it had arrived and they... The 120 uh, men and women from verses uh, 12 through 15 or so in chapter 1, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire place where they were sitting. Tongues of fire appeared over them and rested, stood still on each one of them and they were all filled 
with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Again, just, just to tie back into last week, I really encourage you and really hope as we go through Acts, every time you see Holy Spirit, underline it, circle it, highlight it, whatever you use in your Bible or, or your phone app that you're using there, because this is the story. So they're standing in this place, and, and we don't know what this place is, and so probably, probably this was an area inside kind of the temple courtyard, because uh, you had 120 people gathered. It's, it's uh, extremely unlikely they were in someone's upstairs in a house. And we also know that everyone who was there, the, the pious Jews, everyone who came rushing in, came rushing in at that sound where they were all gathered together. But listen to the descriptions of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was there suddenly. Uh, some translations will use different words for this, but it's, it's loud, it's rushing, almost violent in nature. It's sudden, it's unexpected, it's wind, it's uncontrollable, it's uncontained. This is the presence of God arriving. And it really does echo a lot of the same things of thunder and wind and fire that we saw when the law was given at Mount Sinai and now the Holy Spirit is given here uh, verse 5 now they were dwelling in Jerusalem pious Jews from every nation under heaven and at this sound the multitude of them came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in their own language and they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear, each of us, in our own native language? Verses 9 through 11 kind of walk through who is there. And it's a lot of information, and it, it doesn't have any flow to it. There's no pattern you can really pick out. But all these groups that were there. And they, they all say, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. They were preaching. They were hearing this, these sermons delivered in their native tongues about the mighty works of God. And they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? And others in the crowd mocking, saying, well, they're drunk. That's the best explanation we can come up with. So Peter stands up and he lifts his voice. Now this is the beginning of something. Everything we've seen about Peter up until this point is the man has all the bravado. He has all the passion. He has all the strength. He has all the confidence when it's like him and John and Jesus. But when he gets in a crowd, Peter tends to crumble. When he gets confronted with people who don't agree with him, Peter tends to be all of us, and Peter tends to slink back at best. And so at this point, this is all happening, and the crowd is jeering and calling him a bunch of drunks, and Peter stands up and yells out, yells out above the crowd and addresses them. It says, people of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, because people had come from all over for Pentecost, the city had swelled uh, four times the size of its normal self for this celebration. He said, these, these people aren't drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was uttered from the prophet Joel. We're not drunk. It's 9 a.m. What you are seeing is what was foretold. And he quotes from Joel. In the last days, being in the last days when the Messiah has arrived. They've been waiting for the Messiah, the promised one, the chosen one, the one that was come to save. In those last days, it shall be, God declares, that I, God, will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. 
even on my male servants and my female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. John, John had come, John the Baptist, John the baptizer, he had come, he had baptized people, he'd dunk them under the water, he'd bring them back out. And John always said, but the one who comes after me baptizes with fire. This was it. This was it. The flaming tongues, the fire that rested over these people was the baptism of fire that everyone had talked about, that John had talked about, that the prophecies had foretold, that all of this was coming. This day had finally arrived, and fire from heaven had filled the people, the men, the women, all of them, everyone, and they all preached, and everyone heard it, and everyone was trying to figure out what in the world this was supposed to mean. Verse 21, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter goes on. He ties back into what so many other people have said up to this point, including both times that Luke records the story of the angels appearing and talking to the women at the tomb and then talking to the group at the ascension. And, and here Luke says it again, this Jesus, this Jesus right here, this exact Jesus delivered up according to the plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed him. Peter is addressing this crowd and he, he points blatantly at him. He said, this Jesus who did all this, you bound him up, you turned him over, you betrayed him, and you killed him. This is a very different Peter. Peter had walked with Jesus all the other times where Peter slunk away or hid or yelled and screamed and cussed and all of these different things, trying to make sure people knew he wasn't with Jesus when he'd been walking with Jesus. What has changed is the world got flipped. The Holy Spirit arrived, and the Holy Spirit wasn't given anymore to like a couple people. The Holy Spirit wasn't, wasn't held to one space in a tent or a tabernacle or a temple. The Holy Spirit wasn't chosen about a couple people that would get it. And the Holy Spirit wasn't doled out. It says the Holy Spirit poured out, it, it's, it's the... It's the description of baptism, full immersion, dunked, underwater, surrounded, covered. That is how it's described that the Holy Spirit was on everyone there. Poured out, fully consumed with, baptized under the Holy Spirit. Peter says in verse 24, God raised him up, loosing the birth pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. He goes on preaching this sermon, talking about uh, patriarchs that they had David. Even David died. David's in a tomb. I can take you there. But this one, Jesus isn't. Verse 29, brothers and sisters, I say to you with confidence the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Verse 32, this Jesus, this Jesus God raised up and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit that he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Peter boldly he's laying it out there, there's no there's no misunderstanding he's like this Jesus this one this exact one 
not a figurehead, not an example. This Jesus is God, is Christ, is Messiah, came, you killed him. And this group, this group of pious Jews, right? These are, these are the men and women who have made the, the pilgrimage. They have traveled to Jerusalem. They have come to this place. They are struck to the heart, and they respond the exact same way that the crowd responded to John the Baptist. What do we do now? What do, they, they look to the group, and they say, what do we do? What does this mean? And Peter says, repent. John the Baptist's first word in what you do, repent. Jesus' first word in what you do, repent. Here, Peter, in this, in this sermon, the first word, repent. And quite literally, what repent means is to change your mind. Change your mind. We use it in all kinds of different ways. We summarize it to mean different things. It, it means change your mind. It means the way that you used to think about God incorrectly Change your mind to now a right thinking of the creator. What do we do? You change your mind. You change how you think about God. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you the Jews, and your children, the Jewish families, and for all who are far off, the Gentiles, us, the rest of us. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Verse 42, so then what? It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Awe came upon every one of them, every soul. Many wonders and signs, again, fulfilling that prophecy from Joel. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Physical things, spiritual beliefs, they were together. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Pay attention to verse 47 as we end chapter 2. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. The world got turned upside down, and this was the moment. This was the moment that everything changed. This was the moment that it stopped being about the question the disciples asked in chapter 1. When they asked Jesus, hey, hey, is this the time that Israel gets put back on top to be in charge of everyone. They never ask that question again. The thought is gone. It's irrelevant. It's not the point. That's not the kingdom God talked about. The kingdom of God was this. It was the overlap. It was God arriving. The presence of God being here, here and now. And so they didn't think about kingdom questions in that way anymore. They now swapped to questions about the kingdom of God instead. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Notice it doesn't say praising God and having the favor with everyone who agreed with them. It doesn't say praising God and having the favor of everyone who is in their group. It says praising God and having the favor of all people. It also doesn't say praising God and everyone agreed with them and automatically knew Jesus was king and knelt down and were baptized. We know that's not how this goes either. People who physically walked with Jesus, people who saw Jesus resurrected and walking around after he had died, some of them were like, nah, it's not really for me. 
So, so that's not what it means. But it also doesn't mean that what they did, when it says here, Peter had delivered this sermon, and it says, obviously, this is the cliff notes. We don't have the whole sermon, it says. It says, Peter delivered his sermon, and when this group had heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what do we do? And Peter said, change your mind about God and be baptized you. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. That changed the world. The Holy Spirit came and changed the world. What Peter didn't say in that moment, when they said, what do we do? Peter's answer wasn't, well, you burn in hell unless you think how I think. Peter's answer was, I just think, I just need you to know that you're all wrong and I'm right and I need you to come here quickly. Peter gave the truth of which there is one. And then Peter says, change your mind about your thinking about God. This group of people, yes, they were hunted, they were, they were killed, they were martyred because they taught against the power that was and the kingdom that needed to flip. But they weren't just universally hated by everyone. It says the Holy Spirit came and everything about them changed. They stopped worrying about everything that they had worried about up until this point. Everything that they thought was so important went out the window. And we have everything changing about who is involved. We have all the rules are different. We have the Holy Spirit poured out on all. In this moment, we have the prophecy of Joel coming where men and women are baptized with fire in the Holy Spirit and men and women gathered in this temple area preaching this message and the people come and they say, what are we supposed to do? And they didn't run. The disciples and the apostles, they didn't run. Luke ends with Jesus, is, Jesus leaves and they return and they spend almost all their time in the temple. They, they went back home. They went to church, so to speak, right? Like they didn't leave the Jewish people and go here. They went back into the temple and they started preaching and sharing to change your mind. This Jesus is something different. This Jesus is the fulfillment of everything we've been waiting for for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. People who had never spoken were now preaching. People who had always been fearful and scared and running away were now bold. And the only thing that changed was everything. The Holy Spirit changes everything this is the story of acts luke luke talks about it in in the letter in the book of luke luke talks about everything that jesus began and in acts we see what does this look like in action what happens now acts is the holy spirit has arrived how do we go and put this into practice? It is the day the revolution began. Chapter 3 through chapter 28 are these stories that we'll spend our time in and looking. But it's not a history book. It really is a letter of how we are to live out now in the kingdom of God, which is here and now, it has arrived, the overlap has occurred, the Holy Spirit is here, what does that look like? And it starts with how I'll end today. <laughs> when the Holy Spirit arrived, the Holy Spirit came into this place suddenly with a roaring thunderous sound 
of fire and uncontained, uncontrollable wind. Not many of us ever grew up hearing much about the Holy Spirit. Learned a lot about Jesus and a lot about God the Father, and then there was this like crazy cousin over here that we never talked about. But I think that's why. Can we put God in a box? No. Can we shrink Jesus down to look and act just like us and share our political views? Of course not, but we do it every day. The Holy Spirit, no one can even pretend to do that. There is not one mention of the Holy Spirit in the Bible that isn't just terrifyingly uncontrollable. That's the beauty and the amazement of the Holy Spirit, but it's also what has made people shy away from talking about it. Because we like to think we're in control. And we've had so much practice shrinking God and Jesus down that we can pretend we're even in control there. We haven't figured out how to do that with rushing uncontrollable wind and fire and thunder and earthquake and sudden. And that's why the Holy Spirit is so important and that's why Acts is so important. So I encourage you, go back, read Luke. Read Luke for the buildup here. Read Acts 1 and Acts 2 that we've touched on these weeks and then let's begin working our way through the rest of it together. Let's say a prayer. And after that, Mark will come and lead us in a song. And, and it's during that time that anyone who has questions about Highland View, about this family, uh, prayer requests for something going on in your life, your friends, your family, needs that you have, that we as a family can be a part of in some way, or questions about the Holy Spirit about baptism, about Father, Son, Holy Spirit, about this, G about this Jesus as it's worded over and over again. This one right here, this Jesus. We'd love to answer those questions as best we can, sit with you, talk with you, pray with you, whatever it is that you need this morning. But let's pray. God, thank you for this space, for this, this place that we have to be together. These, these amazing things things, but nonetheless, ways that we have to get out for people to watch online, for, for people who are, are sick or homebound, various reasons that they can join in family, and we can bring them in as family. God, we thank you for these words, and we pray the Holy Spirit to, to grab these words out of midair and translate them into each heart where each person is this morning. The word is alive and the word is alive because of the Holy Spirit. Help us to see you. Help us to see the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the here, the now. Help us to see who and how, how we are supposed to show people you. Help us to know Help us to submit to the Holy Spirit to mirror you. Help people when they look on to see Jesus. Help us to live out that, yes, the disciples were often hated. Yes, Jesus Christ himself was hated unto death, even unto a cross, and help us to live out that we understand fully, fully, fully that people can disagree with us or hate us because of you. But God, forgive us and help no one to ever hate you because of us. Amen. Amen. As Mark comes, we stand. Sing with us. This is the ages from this grandest.